Sugar is not bad, it's essential to your health. The cell needs glucose in order to function properly in an anti-stress state with high energy flow. Research supports the idea that carbohydrates are needed to thrive. The modern demonization of sugar is entirely based on a complete and utter misunderstanding of what sugar is and its vital roles in the human body. The beliefs currently held by the majority of Western society about sugar are all based in received wisdom and are inaccurate. These inaccurate beliefs pour gasoline on an already epidemic level fire of chronic health issues in hundreds of millions of people. Myths around cancer, diabetes, insulin reactivity, and ketosis are keeping the wool pulled over the eyes of millions of people who need help. When it comes to sugar, it's time to think again. Sweets don't have the protein, the vitamins or the minerals. The bodybuilding quality is of other foods. When you send it over the cookie cookie carbs, it triggers inflammation. But surefire way to keep off the counter is to reduce the sugar intake. In 1938, the results of a six-month-long study were published in the Journal of Nutrition. The lab that published them was at a critical crossroads, one that would set the wheels in motion for the public's understanding, or rather misunderstanding, around human health for the next 80 years. The results of the study most certainly would have been considered disturbing to the researchers precisely because it indicated the exact opposite of what the researchers set out to prove. Were true scientific methodology the guiding light, these results would have necessitated a different path than the one that was chosen. But there was a lot at stake and these results were inconvenient. As stated in the advancement of learning, if a man will begin with certainties, he shall end in doubts. But if he will be content to begin with doubts, he shall end in certainties. The lab of George Burr started with certainties and ended in doubts, but it wasn't long before those doubts were completely forgotten, stamped out by the unbridled force of the original certainties. The mental and biological constructs at work in the brain to ensure what scientists call certainty bias are of the strongest kind of misdirected superpower. Robert Burton, MD, former chief of neurology at the University of California at San Francisco, points out that we need to recognize that the feelings of certainty and conviction are involuntary mental sensations, not logical conclusions. Burton points out that there are two separate aspects of a thought, the actual thought and an independent involuntary assessment of the accuracy of that thought. The brain has powerful involuntary mechanisms for unconscious cognitive activity. Many thoughts that surface in someone's mind, researchers included, are driven from this not necessarily logical unconscious inroad. What William James, the father of American psychology and professor of philosophy at Harvard University, referred to in his Gifford lectures as felt knowledge. Often this felt knowledge is much stronger than a logical conclusion and will drive people far beyond the rigid regulations of logical thought, even when they're staring into the cold, unblinking eyes of a conflicting truth, often to their own demise and worse, to the demise of others. It's entirely possible that the Burr Lab in the 1930s was driven chiefly by this felt knowledge. In fact, the evolution of their theories that were birthed at this time would indicate as much, uh, especially the fact that they invented a disease. It seems like these things are part political, part scientific, and part blind ambition, and their rampant divergence from the truth caused side effects and future downstream impacts that no one could have possibly known at the time. So what happened? In the early 1930s, years before the publication of the aforementioned study, Burr was running experiments related to his theory of essential fatty acid deficiency in rats. He noticed that PUFA deficient rats on a specific high sugar diet consumed oxygen at an uncharacteristically high rate. Burr erroneously concluded that first, this increased consumption of oxygen was a bad thing, which was based on a foundational misunderstanding and bias that was brought into the experiment. And secondly, he observed that it was due to a lack of unsaturated fats in the animal's diet. His reasoning was that this lack of unsaturated fats increased the rate at which water escapes as vapor through the skin of the rats, and that because of this, the so-called essential fatty acid deficiency must be overcome in order to slow this rate of evaporation. His observations missed some key pieces to the puzzle. It was the 1930s after all, and scientific understanding of the human body has advanced massively since then. He didn't understand that the amount of water evaporated from an animal's body is actually a reliable indicator of metabolic rate, a direct function of a healthy thyroid gland. The animals were healthier without the essential fatty acids in their diet. When an animal's metabolic rate is higher, it burns calories at a higher rate, creating more heat. The body's natural response is to leverage the sweat glands to help the animal maintain a steady body temperature, and evaporation is the main cooling mechanism. He threw the baby out with the bathwater. This is where William Brown entered the picture in 1938. Working as a researcher in Burr's lab, Brown became curious about the effects of this essential fatty acid deficient diet. 
What type of impact would it have on humans? To that point, it had only been measured in animals. He decided to put it to the test on himself. For six months, Brown consumed a 2,500 calorie per day diet completely void of unsaturated fats and high in sugars in the forms of glucose, fructose, lactose, sucrose, and potato starch, along with micronutrient supplementation from mineral oil, baking soda, and salt, as well as vitamin D3, vitamin A, and iron. Despite the fact that the Burr Laboratory was clutching onto the idea that a diet without unsaturated fatty acids was unhealthy and caused the fake disease of their own invention, essential fatty acid deficiency, the results from Brown's study were undeniable. This diet made him healthier. First, Brown had suffered since childhood from migraines. Within six weeks on this high sugar diet, they completely subsided and never returned. Secondly, he started the diet with a slightly high blood pressure. A few months into the experimental diet, his blood pressure completely normalized. He also lost a significant amount of weight through this six month period, corresponding to a measurable increase in his metabolic rate indicators. He went from 152 pounds at the start of the dieting period with a metabolic rate at minus 12% below normal, and within a few months raised his metabolic rate to just minus 2% below normal while dropping to 138 pounds, which he easily maintained through the end of the study period. At 2,500 calories per day, mostly from sugar, this is a feat most people would not believe possible, especially at his body weight and without extra activity. Brown also reported a noticeable increase in energy throughout his work days. For he used to feel a sense of fatigue at the end of the day, he reported that this fatigue completely disappeared while on the diet. And similar to the rats, his respiratory quotient actually increased, which is a good indicator of an increased metabolism and improved thyroid function. His respiratory quotient was at 1.0, even hitting as high as 1.14 during the six month long study. A respiratory quotient of 1.0 and above indicates an exceptional ability of the body to oxidize pure carbohydrate for fuel. Juxtapose this against the respiratory quotient of a type 2 diabetic, which can fall down into the 0.7 range, indicative of a preference in the diabetic physiology of oxidizing fatty acids instead of carbohydrates. And weirdly, despite the reporting that the diet didn't significantly change Brown's cholesterol measurements, it actually dropped his total serum cholesterol quite a bit, going from 298 to 206 milligrams per deciliter over the first four months. That's significant in my book. Despite these findings about the lack of fatty acids in the higher sugar diet actually improving the health biomarkers of not just the animals, but also Brown's six month long study, Burr decided to push forward with his essential fatty acid hypothesis. Funny enough, it mostly fell on deaf ears in the scientific community at the time because the other researchers were finding the positive health benefits to the exact opposite of what Burr was claiming with his essential fatty acid hypothesis. The other researchers at that time were actually finding that as the thyroid gland improved with a higher sugar diet and a lower polyunsaturated fat diet, the serum cholesterol numbers also normalized into a healthy range. Unfortunately, this was all forgotten when the seed oil industry stepped into the picture and changed the course of Western society for the remainder of the century. To sum it up in the context of Burr and his essential fatty acid deficiency hypothesis, once cottonseed oil no longer had a distribution in the paint industry, the massive surplus of this oil and other vegetable oils in the US in the early 1900s spurred the marketing of it as a food product. With a steady introduction into the American food supply, primarily via companies like Wesson, J.M. Smucker, and Procter & Gamble. The essential fatty acid deficiency hypothesis was the perfect marketing fodder to prop up a, quote, scientific argument for why Americans should start consuming more vegetable oils in mass, since these vegetable oils are entirely made up of the same fatty acids as Burr was asserting to be essential, polyunsaturated fats, or PUFAs. The very fact that they became referred to as vegetable oils is actually a misnomer and a good testament to the power of the propaganda in the 20th century food marketing, especially because they're not taken from vegetables at all, they're taken from seeds. If you're deficient in these essential vegetable oils, you cannot possibly be healthy. The propaganda began to spread like wildfire, to the tune of billions in profits, no doubt with the help of the prodigal propagandist Edward Bernays, a nephew of Sigmund Freud who worked with companies like Procter & Gamble during this time. He's also well known for the central role he played in convincing the American public that water fluoridation was healthy and necessary. He convinced us that cigarettes were cool, and in working with the large multinational corporation United Fruit Company, now named Chiquita Brands International, and the US government to overthrow the democratically elected president of Guatemala, Jacobo Arbenz Guzman, who took a hard line against the United Fruit Company's exploitative labor practices in Guatemala in Operation PB Success in 1954. It's important to understand the historical sequence of events here and the players involved when making your decision around the topic of sugar, especially since sugar, vegetable oils, and essential fatty acids, uh, cholesterol, 
and heart disease are all such intricately tied topics in the marketing and propaganda milieu of the 20th and 21st centuries. This sequence of events made certain corporations massive amounts of money, setting them up to be the top most influential and most powerful companies on earth now in the 21st century, while also causing a massive confusion within the medical, scientific, and research communities, trickling down to the general public and no doubt correlating. Now it even goes so far as to suggest a causal role with the epidemic rise in chronic metabolic disease in the world population over the last 100 years. With obesity tripling since 1975, where more than one in three adults are now overweight, and over 340 million children were found to be overweight in a 2016 population survey. Why does everyone still believe sugar is bad for you, especially when on the population level, sugar consumption is actually going down, while obesity and type 2 diabetes continue to rise at epidemic levels? The idea that eating sugar causes obesity, type 2 diabetes, and cancer is a pre-scientific belief, perpetuated through the last few centuries to the detriment of hundreds of millions of people. The development of this sugar disease theory rode alongside and relied heavily upon the veracity of the lipid theory of heart disease, which indicts cholesterol and saturated fat consumption as causal factors in cardiovascular disease. And despite the fact that these theories have both been thoroughly disproven, these inaccurate ideas remain firmly seated in the dogmatic throne at the center of the temple of the cultural hive mind held as immutable truth. To paint an accurate picture of reality, we need to understand the origin of these debunked theories. Confucius put it simply, study the past if you would define the future. Everyone loves to demonize sugar as the cause for obesity, but when you actually analyze the research and the biochemistry of the human body, you start to see a very different picture unfold. People rarely ever consume sugar in its pure form. When was the last time you ate a spoonful of raw coconut or maple sugar, real honey, or royal jelly? For many people, probably never. First off, sugar does not equal candy bars, baked goods, and cakes, or any of these other junk foods that people commonly associate with the word. They're just not the same thing. All these foodstuffs are nothing more than nutrient void garbage foods that should be consumed sparingly if at all. They contain large amounts of polyunsaturated fats, grain flours, and franken food ingredients and flavoring chemicals that negatively influence your health far more than just a little sucrose. This is the real crime in implicating sugar as something that's bad for the body because the baby gets thrown out with the bathwater. People by association demonize fruit, honey, and even just simple raw cane sugar with zero real evidence for its negative effects in the context of an otherwise solid hormonally focused diet like the thermo diet. Rarely do people actually truly understand what sugar really is or how it actually acts in the body and how it contributes to things like obesity, inflammation, and hormones. Now that we've moved over from blaming saturated fat for all of our health problems, it's now the hip thing to demonize sugar as the cause for obesity and type 2 diabetes. Sugar is the perfect target, and it certainly gets its share of a bad rep already. But did you know that even though we try to blame sugar for everything and say that we're getting fatter and fatter due to increased sugar usage, Science actually shows that sugar consumption has dropped during this time and that obesity rates have dramatically risen. One study calls this the Australian paradox, as during the time frame of 1980 to 2003, obesity rates tripled in the country, yet the intake of refined sugar dropped by 23%. Sugars are naturally occurring carbohydrates that provide energy for the body in the forms of glucose and fructose. For example, the brain requires up to 130 grams of glucose per day for its basic daily energy needs. Major internal organs, glands, and muscles all use glucose as their main energy source. If you deprive the body from this, it will try to make up for it by a process called gluconeogenesis, in which the body breaks down protein and fatty acids to create glucose. Do this long enough and your body goes into ketosis, which is just another form of metabolic stress during glucose deprivation. Almost all carbohydrates, starches, and sugars break down to glucose, the simplest form of sugar after ingestion. The rate at which this happens is measured by the glycemic index or glycemic load. Although the low-carbers tried for many years to confuse average people into believing that low glycemic index foods would be it for weight loss, research has shown time and again that it was the total energy intake of daily calories, not the GI, that is behind our ability to gain or lose weight. The most common kinds of sugars in our diet include glucose, which is the simplest form of sugar and the main energy provider of the cells in the body. The blood sugar in your veins is also glucose. Fructose, found naturally in fruits and honey, it's much sweeter than glucose and it's metabolized in the liver instead of the gut. Sucrose, or table sugar, is 50% fructose and 50% glucose, extracted from beets or sugar cane. Sucrose occurs naturally in vegetables and fruit. Lactose, which is milk sugar, is found in milk and dairy products. There's also maltose, which is found in malted drinks and beer. 
The studies looking into the effects of sugar on various health parameters typically use pure fructose, pure glucose, or pure sucrose. However, in the context of our normal daily lives, the typical type of sugar that people are consuming is roughly a balance of 50% glucose and 50% fructose, the latter of which is metabolized in the liver and rapidly absorbed. The best possible way to fully understand sugar is to understand the structure and function of carbohydrates inside the human body. Carbohydrates are organic compounds that contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. The convenient shorthand that scientists use to reference a carbohydrate, or carbohydrate-fed subject group, in the literature is actually CHO, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Carbohydrates are the most abundant biomolecule on Earth, and they're used for accessible energy to fuel cellular reactions and for vital structural support of cell membranes. The presence of the carbohydrate enhances the ability of the cell to not just function at baseline, but to be able to improve its functionality over time, as long as it has a steady access to a source of carbohydrate. For example, a cell can use a carbohydrate molecule to bind the lipids in the cell membrane to improve cell identification, cell signaling, and cellular immune responses. Certain forms of carbohydrates such as deoxyribose and ribose are essential parts of DNA and RNA molecules structure and function. There are thousands of different types of carbohydrates, but they all consist of one or more units called monosaccharides. Monosaccharides are named accordingly, with Greek roots as simple sugars. The number and type of monosaccharide used, as well as the positioning of how they're bonded with one another, determines the structure of a carbohydrate. For example, sucrose, or table sugar, is known as a disaccharide and is formed by the bonding of two monosaccharides, glucose and fructose. Different monosaccharide pairs form a lot of the common sugars we associate with food, such as sucrose maltose, which is two glucose monomers, and lactose, which is glucose and a galactose monomer. Polysaccharides, also known as complex carbohydrates, consist of chains of hundreds or more monosaccharide units, and they're usually, but not always, composed of the same type of monosaccharides, such as glucose, linked together in different numbers. Polysaccharides are great for energy use and storage in the human body since they're so easily built and broken down by enzymes naturally found within the body. We create glucose polymers to be stored as energy in the form of glycogen in the liver and muscle tissue. This allows it to be stored in a compact surface area, but provides large amounts of easily available energy when needed. Since glycogen is such a heavily relied upon source of energy in the body, especially in times of urgent need, glycogen depletion, when we don't consume enough glucose in our diet or when we intentionally run our glycogen stores low, can actually cause detrimental side effects in energy production, most commonly described as hitting the wall or bonking in athletics. When the body is fully depleted of glycogen, a shift in stress hormone production facilitates a process known as gluconeogenesis, or the creation of glucose from lactate, pyruvate, and amino acids, and it's characteristic of a catabolic or stressed metabolism. Gluconeogenesis is a survival mechanism ingrained in the body that can help keep the organism alive in the absence of glucose-rich food. It requires a highly stressed and catabolic shift in certain hormone production, such as cortisol and adrenaline, and is not preferable for healthy long-term condition. Many people report feeling great for a short period of time after this hormonal shift, however this feeling of well-being is also a survival mechanism for the animal, and it's commonly known as the catecholamine honeymoon, characterized by a sharp rise in catecholamines like adrenaline, followed by the decreased sensitivity to such hormones, despite their chronically elevated levels of release into the blood in order to sustain gluconeogenesis in the absence of glucose. After as short as just a few weeks in this condition, the negative effects of these catabolic stress hormones become quite noticeable. Decreases in energy, hair thinning, insomnia, loss of sex drive, loss of muscle tissue, and stubborn body fat. Due to the demonization of sugar, it might seem a bit outer worldish to claim that sugar can actually have health benefits for the body. Yet it does, and it actually makes a lot of sense. There's plenty of research showing how glucose and fructose actually negatively correlate with diabetes, and that fructose, due to the fact that it's metabolized in the liver, doesn't need insulin to be pushed into the cells, which is probably why higher intakes of fructose have been found to improve, yes, improve insulin sensitivity. Bears coming out of hibernation reverse their full-blown diabetic state by eating honey, which is a rich source of fructose. Scientists are now presenting evidence that diet is the primary driver of the evolution of the complexity of the primate, and possibly human brain. Among all studied primates, the frugivores, animals who may be omnivore or herbivore, but whose diets consist mainly of raw fruits, actually have the largest, most complex brains. The sugars in the fruits are literally fueling their brains to grow. 
Sugars are the primary fuel for the thyroid gland, and the thyroid gland actually controls the rate at which your body burns calories, i.e. your metabolic rate. When you eat more simple sugars, your thyroid gland produces more T4 thyroid hormone, and with adequate sugar stored in the liver, your body can easily convert T4 into active T3 form, which greatly improves energy production and metabolic rate. If sugars and carbohydrates make us all fat, why in the world have almost all bodybuilders for the last 100 years eaten high-carb diets while getting to extremely low body fat levels? When you lower your calories in order to lose weight, one of the most powerful compounds that can preserve metabolic rate is in fact fructose. It supposedly is the substance most notorious for making us gain weight, but in reality, high fructose foods are typically low in caloric content, have the ability to greatly support metabolic rate, and have a muscle sparing effect. The liver provides about 70% of our active thyroid hormone by converting thyroxin to T3, but it can provide this active hormone only when it has adequate glucose. With everyone running around and yelling about sugar being toxic, it might seem kind of strange to think about the fact that sugar plays a very important role in your body's natural antioxidant defense system, which helps you fight off free radical stress and lower inflammation. Glutathione is your master antioxidant in the body and glucose plays a vitally important role in its production. We have a complex endogenous antioxidant system that's ultimately fueled by glucose. There's a pathway known as the pentose phosphate pathway where glucose supplies reducing power to NADPH from niacin or vitamin B3 in the form of hydrogen ions and electrons. Vitamin B2 is then used by the vital enzyme glutathione reductase to pass this reducing power on to glutathione. Glutathione, your master antioxidant, is then able to neutralize hydrogen peroxide to water and neutralize lipid peroxides or free radicals from fatty acids like PUFAs into hydroxy fatty acids, which are much less harmful to the body, while recycling vitamin C, another important antioxidant. Vitamin C recycles vitamin E, which is your most important defensive antioxidant against PUFA oxidation. As you can see, this entire system and all of glutathione's important roles in the body, from fighting against the accumulation of inflammatory free radical species, to protecting against the degradation of fatty acids in the cell membranes, to cleaning up damage caused by PUFAs, all ultimately depends on the availability and action of glucose, sugar. I'd like to point out an important truth about cancer and the role of sugar and fatty acids in cancer. This is important for you to understand precisely because one of the key mythical mantras that's been repeated over the last 30 years is that cancer is addicted to sugar and that it cannot survive in the absence of glucose. This cannot be further from the truth and the medical community has known about this for well over a decade and has accumulated quite a lot of research to back it up. This mantra has been one of the main talking points we've all heard from proponents of the ketogenic diet and has been used to prop up their arguments that sugar is the devil. However, there's a substantial evidence demonstrating that a ketogenic diet itself can rapidly accelerate the growth of cancer cells. With a common mutation that's found in over 60% of cases of melanoma, 100% of hairy cell leukemia, 10% of colorectal cancer, and 5% of multiple myeloma. Research published in the journal Cell Metabolism in 2017 demonstrated how this extremely common mutation, V600E, rewires the cancer cell's metabolic preference to that of the ketogenic pathway. It does this in order to create a feedback loop to pour fuel on the fire for the cancer cell growth and further proliferation throughout the body. A common energy source in ketosis is acetoacetate. With V600E, the acetoacetate binds a specific protein, the BRAF protein, which promotes oncogenic activity, which gives the cells distinct advantages in growing faster through potential further mutations, gene amplification, and chromosome rearrangements. This becomes even scarier when you realize that the cancer literally mutates itself in order to fuel its growth through what you eat. Researchers found that when they fed mice with V600E, a high-fat ketogenic diet, the tumor growth literally doubled in just four weeks. As they put it, consistent with our findings, we found that treatment with a high-fat diet promoted tumor growth rate, sizes, and masses. Fat oxidation has been found to promote the survival of cancer cells. This is why I think that it's so important to avoid PUFAs as much as possible since they are so easily oxidized. Cancer cells are tricky creatures and they have the uncanny ability to mutate and adapt in order to survive. Leukemia cells, for example, prefer to use the fatty acid metabolism in order to inhibit a certain protein to avoid apoptosis or programmed cell death. This helps the leukemia cells proliferate and multiply. Again, the important role of fatty acid oxidation in cancer growth is very well known in scientific circles. The public just isn't as aware. Like Dr. Aaron Curry, PhD from the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics at UCSF, puts it in her paper entitled Cellular Fatty Acid Metabolism in Cancer, Cellular proliferation, a common feature of all cancers, requires fatty acids for its synthesis of membranes and signaling molecules. Here we summarize the evidence that limiting fatty acid availability can control cancer cell proliferation. 
The important thing to understand when it comes to cancer cells is that a blanket idea such as cancer is addicted to sugar or cancer stars without sugar are quite simply untrue. Cancers can mutate rapidly and get fuel from many things, even amino acids like glutamine. Therefore, the most prudent way to approach cancer treatment from a dietary perspective is for someone to learn about their cancer specifically and follow what's known as a precision diet approach to combat that specific cancer. It's not a one-size-fits-all argument. All ideas that would say it is are utterly non-scientific. The single most common scapegoat for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is fructose. Everyone points the finger without any real evidence. If you've truly solved fatty liver disease, then how come the incidence of it continue to rise so rapidly? And how come they've more than doubled in children over the last 10 years? They're missing a key element to the equation. In reality, fructose has been shown to be protective against hepatic liver problems. And when there's adequate choline in the diet, overfeeding of fructose does not lead to fat accumulation in the liver at all. The problem of fatty liver disease has nothing to do with fructose and everything to do with eating too much polyunsaturated fatty acids, which prevent exportation of liver fat, and lack of choline, which is a necessary micronutrient required in the exportation of fat from the liver as well. To avoid fatty liver disease, you must avoid consuming PUFAs while simultaneously making sure you're not deficient in choline. Choline is one of the single most common nutrient deficiencies in the United States, with an estimated 92% of the entire population carrying this deficiency. With the prevalence of PUFAs in our cooking oils being used at nearly every restaurant and in most packaged foods, alongside a 92% population-wide choline deficiency, it's no wonder that around a whopping 100 million adults in the United States are estimated to have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease that continues to rise every single year. The important thing to understand is that a lot of people are just missing the point. They're missing the fact that polyunsaturated fats and essential fatty acids are truly what's causing a lot of these health problems that sugar gets demonized for. And within the presence of this rampant demonization of sugar, even with the lack of scientific evidence to back it up, the sugar myth pervades. Sugar is essential to health, and it's time that we think again.